Good evening and welcome to Insurance and Financial Planning brought to you by the Hemophilia Federation of America's Families and Blood Brotherhood Program. I am Carrie Koenig, Families Program Coordinator at HSA. Also on the line, we have Sarah Shinkson, Advocacy and Outreach Manager, Lauren Nybert, Programs Director, and Miriam Goldstein, Senior Policy Analyst at HSA. Just a few helpful hints before we get started. We have allotted approximately one hour for tonight's webinar. We welcome your participation and questions. However, your audio will be muted for the duration of our webinar presentation by our system as it helps eliminate background noise. We do encourage your participation, and if you would like to ask a question, please utilize the chat tool at the bottom right of your control panel. We will then pass your questions on to our facilitator. We will be answering all questions at the end of the presentation. We would like to take a moment to thank Accredo, Genentech, Shire, and CDC Collaborative Partners for their funding of our Blood Brotherhood program. Also, we'd like to thank Genentech, Nova Nordisk, Bayer, Accredo, and the CDC Collaborative Partners for funding our families program. Without their generous donations, this webinar would not be possible. This evening, Miriam Goldstein, HFA Senior Policy Analyst, will be leading our presentation. Miriam will present an overview of insurance coverage, the Affordable Care Act, patient assistance programs, and saving for medical expenses. Miriam will also discuss and explain ABLE accounts, a new form of savings account available to some individuals with disabilities. I'd like to now turn it over to her. Miriam? Thanks, Gary. And thanks, everyone who's tuning in um, to, to listen to this program. Um, tonight's program is a little bit of a hodgepodge. The topics are all, can all fall under an, uh, kind of an umbrella in that they describe tools or considerations to keep your finances healthy as you live life with a breathing disorder. Um, so we're going to talk about how do you assess a health plan or compare competing health plans to find a plan that makes sense for you, one that's going to cover your needs at a cost that you can afford. We're also going to talk a little bit about patient assistance programs that might be available from factor manufacturers or other places that can help with your health care costs. And we're going to talk about ABLE accounts, which is a new option for savings um, that is available to some eligible individuals with disabilities. So let's talk about choosing an insurance plan first. Um, this is really timely because open enrollment is going on now. It's, open enrollment periods are usually in the fall. Um, if you have employer-provided coverage, you should check for your, with your HR department for what the precise dates are for your open enrollment period. For marketplace plans, um, the open enrollment period is November 1 to January 31, so it's going on now. Um, and in most states, December 15th is the deadline to enroll for plan coverage that would be effective beginning on January 1. You can still enroll later, but that uh, coverage won't be effective right away. Um, Medicare open enrollment actually closes tonight. That's for um, Medicare uh, Advantage plans and Medicare prescription drug plans. So what's the process that, is, that you should go through as you're comparing plans or looking at plans? Uh, first, a really good first step is to think about your, your recent history of healthcare usage. So um, the past benefits versus the ex expenses that you can anticipate. In the past two years, what were your yearly out-of-pocket costs? Um, which doctors or therapists or specialists did you need last year, and are you going to need the same ones in the coming year? Uh, crucially, of course, how much did you spend on prescription drugs? But also think about other expenses that may not loom quite as large, optical care or dental costs. Create a budget, and so as, as you're thinking about the costs of health care, obviously you think about the monthly premiums, but you also look at deductibles, um, whether there are health saving account options, and whether you're um, anticipating any extraordinary health costs in the coming year. I really want to stress one thing. Um, if you choose a plan with lower premiums, that's going to come with a higher deductible, and generally less generous coverage. So the lowest premium plan is not always the one that is going to cost you the least money overall. Um, 
if you go with a lower premium but higher deductible plan, think about would you be able to pay a large sum in the middle of the year if you had an unexpected hospital stay or any unexpected expense for it? It could be in the beginning of the year. Um, if you believe you could take that financial hit, then maybe a lower premium plan makes sense. But if you know that you couldn't, well, uh, choosing a plan with a higher premium and with lower cost sharing is something that you want to look at. Planning for out-of-pocket costs. Um, this is a, a tricky thing. You have to think about what would be your deductibles, your co-insurance, your co-payments. These are payments in addition to the premiums that you have to pay for your coverage. Um, there are annual out-of-pocket maximums that, that limit how much you have to spend out of pocket in a given year. And so for the coming year, it's $7,150 for an individual and twice that for family. That is still a big amount of money. Um, also, out of pocket costs that you might be responsible for um, that don't count towards those feelings, the $7,150 or the $14,300 include premiums. So your premiums are, the out-of-pocket costs are separate from what you're paying for premiums. And it also costs such as balance billing amounts if you're going to non-network providers and other non-network costs, spending on things that are considered non-essential health benefits. All of these would be out-of-pocket costs and you need to think about your ability to absorb those. This slide um, I, I'm, it, it talks about what percentage of your health care costs an average consumer could expect his or her plan to cover. So it's an average consumer. It's not, it's not a hard and fast rule that will apply to each person. Um, and it's broken down by different types of plans. So here at the bottom of the chart, the bronze marketplace plans, those are some of the ones that would come with lower premiums, but you can see that the plan pays a much lower percentage of the overall costs, only 60% as opposed to 70, 75, 80 or more. So again, this goes to the point that the cheapest premiums are not always the best deal. Um, another really important thing to keep in mind in that regard, if you are buying insurance on the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. There is cost sharing assistance that will help you with out-of-pocket costs um, in, in certain circumstances. The cost sharing assistance is available to certain low and moderate income beneficiaries, basically with income between 100 and 250 percent of the federal poverty level. But that cost sharing assistance is only available if you buy a silver plan on the marketplace. So opting for that cheapest bronze marketplace plan means that you are foregoing possible, if you will fall within this category of eligibility, you are foregoing possible cost sharing assistance and reductions. Um, so very important to keep in mind. In addition to, to looking at costs and premiums, review, review, review. You have to, well, insurance plan documents are not fascinating reading, but unfortunately there's, you have to read them really carefully and ask questions about the plan. There are many details and, um, and it, this is important to do at the start of the new plan year, even if you think you will be continuing with the plan you were on last year. Health plans can make significant changes to their offerings at the start of a new plan year. So even if you're sticking with your same, say, employer-provided insurance, review the New Year's plan documents for any changes in co-pays, co-insurance, formularies, and so on. So as you're reviewing your plan, what are the things you're looking for? One key thing is, are your providers and network? Make sure that your HTC or your physical therapist, clinic, hospital are in network. Any other important providers that you want to stay with and not have to, to change um, your healthcare provider. 
Um, networks change from year to year, so again, you have to you have to look at this every year because if your provider drops out of network, your expenses could go up dramatically. Also, unfortunately, um, directories of providers are not always accurate or up to date. So your best bet really is to call the provider directly to verify whether or not they are in network. The same is absolutely true with respect to your pharmacy or specialty pharmacy. Um, the pharmacies contract with insurers to, to be in their networks. Um, if you have a specialty pharmacy that you want to continue with, um, they will absolutely know whether or not they are in network. So if you have a specialty pharmacy or home care or 340B that you want to continue with, call them to verify whether they are in network. Medication. This is really key. Um, you want to check that your plan covers your medication um, and uh, hopefully that they have not developed a formulary, a list of included and excluded drugs that um, puts your drug in a category that is more expensive. Um, we've seen uh, private insurance companies start to implement formularies and to group uh, factor products into different tiers and start charging different rates for them. Um, so check to see if your plan is is doing anything like this and where your product of choice lies if there are peers with different cost sharing requirements. Um, check also to see if your product is covered under major medical or under pharmacy, uh, under the pharmacy benefit side. This can affect how your copay assistance works or, or what you are expected to pay and when you are expected to pay it. Um, so make sure you understand what out-of-pocket costs you might have to pay with respect to your medication. Is it a flat copay or is it a percentage coinsurance, which would typically be much larger? Do you have to set aside a deductible before your plan starts paying for your medication? Um, Unfortunately, if, you're, if, if your clotting factor is built on the pharmacy side, a lot of plans have now gone from copay to coinsurance. So this is a really important um, piece of information to have. Um, durable medical equipment coverage. Um, these might be wheelchairs or cryo cups and so on. Um, you, you can check and see if your plan covers this. Um, you also need to know the rules that your plan sets out. So um, will you be required to get prior approval to see a specialist? Do you need to go to your internist and get a, a written referral? Do you need prior authorization for any specific treatments? Are there limits to the number of times that you can receive certain services or visit certain providers? Um, sometimes there might be limits to the number of physical therapy visits or home nursing visits. And what are the rules if you need to see an out-of-network provider? So a lot there to, to look at and to, um, to explore and to understand as you're weighing um, the, the different insurance plans. And obviously they are very expensive. Um, the good news is that there are some patient assistance programs that may also help you as you uh, figure out how you are going to uh, provide your health plan coverage for the coming year. These kind of fall into two categories. There's premium assistance. So um, there's the nonprofit companies such as PS and PSI is one of the leading ones that um, will help you if you need assistance in paying premiums to stay insured. Um, now one caveat um, with respect to premium assistance, if you are on a marketplace plan, you might not be able to accept help in the form of premium assistance. Um, you have to check with your plan. As you may know, this has been one of HFA's and NHF's policy priorities, um, getting federal legislation to say that insurance companies have to accept 
nonprofit third party premium assistance. And we will continue to be working on that in the coming year. But um, this is something that people at PSI or at your plan can tell you whether or not this form of assistance is available to you. Um, a separate category is copay assistance. And this would um, typically come from the factor manufacturers. Um, and they can provide um, copay assistance specific to the factor products the, that they sell. Um, so you can check with your um, the company that you get factor from or with your um, HTC social worker. Um, sometimes uh, the assistance programs might depend on the income level or on plan, but this is um, an, an area of resources that's very worth checking out. Um, the HFA website also has a section on navigating the patient assistance programs, and you can find that uh, under news and stories in the resource library on the HFA website. So we're going to switch gears now away from uh, insurance and um, and getting healthcare coverage, and we're going to talk about ABLE accounts. Um, ABLE accounts are a new kind of savings vehicle um, that are that's available to some individuals with disabilities. It was created under very recent federal law. Um, these laws were passed in 2014 and 2015 by bipartisan uh, groups in, in the Congress. Um, and the idea was to recognize that people who have disabilities are going to face special financial burdens and that those increased financial needs are going to continue throughout their lifetimes. And so um, Congress set out to provide a vehicle to allow people who have disabilities to save for future needs. And critically, they wanted to do this without cutting off a beneficiary's eligibility for um, federal programs, including means-tested programs like Medicaid and Social Security benefits. So um, I, as I said, the, the ABLE accounts are created under federal law, but um, the way the law works, the states have to set up and administer their programs. And if you have experience with the 529 college savings plans, this is very similar. Um, the, the federal law says tax treatment and so on is recognized in federal law, but states, you go ahead and set up these programs. So as of last month, five states had, had set up their programs, and they're listed here. But almost all the other states have enacted ABLE legislation, and they're at varying stages of implementation. Two of them, Virginia and Oregon, are actually expected to launch their ABLE programs in the next couple of weeks. Also, if you are raring to go, um, most of the states allow out-of-state residents to participate in their ABLE programs. Florida is the one exception so far. Uh, to participate in the Florida ABLE program, you have to be in this Florida. But there are pretty stringent eligibility requirements to, to be able to qualify for opening one of these accounts. And the first one is disability, because it was intended for individuals with disabilities. So any individual who, by virtue of disability, already um, qualifies to get Social Security benefits is automatically eligible to open an ABLE account um, subject to the age requirement that I'll talk about in a little bit. But even if, if you don't already uh, receive or you're not already qualified to receive uh, Social Security benefits, an individual can certify under penalty of perjury that by virtue of disability they, re they meet the Social Security Administration criteria about having a functional limitation on their disability. Um, this is um, very much like when you apply for a mortgage. You sign documents saying, um, because most mortgages are insured by the federal government, that you are signing under penalty of law that you are telling the truth and the documents you're 
filling out. Um, and so the same thing here, you're certifying under penalty of perjury that you have this disability. Um, you have to have a letter from a licensed physician confirming that diagnosis. So um, in the end, I think the regs do not require you to submit that letter, you just have to have it. But talking about oh, when we were saying that there are stringent um, eligibility criteria, another one is age limit. So to be able to open an ABLE account, you have the individual has to have significant disabilities and have an age of onset of disability before 26 years of age. This doesn't mean that you're barred for, or you're ineligible if you are now, say, 32. Um, you can still be eligible to open an ABLE account if um, the disability occurred before the date on which you reached the age of 26. Um, now, because this uh, law is so new, uh, there are some aspects that haven't yet been fleshed out. And um, one of them is uh, with hematuria, obviously, you are born with that. So you have that from before, when you, before the age of 26. But what happens if um, you didn't uh, meet the functional standards of disability that we were talking about until after the age of 26? It's hard to know exactly how that case would be handled. Um, I did talk, there's a group in town that is the uh, repository for everything um, about ABLE accounts and I talked to uh, one of their analysts and he said he thought that that individual would still be able to just by virtue of having um, a bleeding disorder from birth that made them eligible. But I have to say it's a little bit of an open question right now. Um, so what are the features, excuse me, features of an ABLE account? And one of the key features is that um, the disabled individual is the account owner or beneficiary. So that means, um, for example, if, if you're opening this account for a child, maybe a 15-year-old, um, that 15-year-old you, you may not be may not be able to uh, open their own account and you know be trusted with the management of a substantial amount of money. Um, so in that kind of circumstance, a parent or legal guardian can act on behalf of that individual to open and manage the account. But the parent or legal guardian doesn't own the account. The account has to be administered for the benefit of the designated beneficiary. Um, another uh, key point is that a beneficiary can only own one ABLE account. And this becomes relevant because as we'll go on and see, there are limits on how much can go into an account and you can't sidestep those limits by opening multiple accounts. So um, who can put money into the account? And the good news is anyone. Uh, the account owner himself or herself can put in money or earnings, family members can, friends. But there is a limit. Um, total contributions to the account, total uh, amounts of money they put into the account can't exceed $14,000 a year. Um, and another uh, little tidbit is that those contributions are made with post-tax dollars. That means that the person who's putting in money does not get a federal income tax deduction for putting money into the account. Um, but something to investigate is that in some states, you might be able to get a state income tax deduction for a portion or all of what you pay into the account. So that's a little wrinkle um, from the tax treatment. Um, importantly, the, the beneficiary or the owner of the ABLE account can contribute um, his or her own earnings. Um, so there's a, a side note again, remember one of the key purposes of this law was to um, allow savings without imperiling people's eligibility for uh, Social Security and Medicaid and so on. Um, so these earnings, there's uh, something called a substan substantial gainful activity test um, that governs your eligibility for Social Security cash benefits. So 
earnings that you put into an ABLE account still count towards that amount. Um, they're, they're not deducted from that amount. Um, overall uh, contribution limit, so there's the $14,000 a year limit, but there's also cumulative limits, and those are going to be set by the different states. A lot of states have, already, have set that, and remember a lot of states have already passed their laws, even if they haven't opened their, opened their programs, and a lot of states have set that limit at or above $300,000, so we are talking 21 years off because it will take that long to to get to $300,000 at, at the rate of $14,000 a year. Um, what can money be spent on? The distributions from an ABLE account, so that means withdrawals or money taken out from an ABLE account, aren't taxable. They aren't counted in the gross income of the account owner, as long as the funds are used for qualified disability expenses. And Congress, um, intentionally took a very broad view of what's a qualified disability expense. Um, the expenses can relate to long-term or short-term needs, and they, they really wanted um, to allow this money to assist in not only help, but maintaining the independence and quality of life of the account beneficiary. So examples of things that it's valid to spend ABLE account money on is not just medical treatment, but also health, prevention, and wellness. Education, tutoring, and job training, those are all things that can affect your future and your independence and your quality of life. Housing, transportation, assistive technology, you can see it's a pretty wide range of things that count as qualified disability expenses. Um, and again, the assets in the ABLE account and contributions to the account and then withdrawals from the account for qualified expenses don't, ex don't affect the owner's eligibility for Medicaid and other uh, means-tested programs. There's one little exception for um, relating to um, an individual's eligibility for Social Security cash payments, but I think I, it's here on the slides if you'd like to look at it. But it, again, it relates to when the account exceeds $100,000. So that's seven years off at the $14,000 a year limit, and um, I put it there for information purposes. Um, so how does an ABLE account work? It's not just a bank account. It's, um, again, like the 529 college savings plan, it's more like a mutual fund type of investment. Um, and so again, like the 529 college savings plans, states are most likely going to offer a variety of options with different investment strategies and um, different levels of risk and correspondingly different levels of reward. Um, so that's something to definitely look into. Um, again, you, uh, an individual can choose to open an account in a state where they're not resident, so this further expands the number of options available. There's a group of 11 states that are forming a consortium to expand options. So again, you can see there's going to be quite a varied menu of, of possible investment vehicles. Um, also, account owners and, and or the, the parent or agent or guardian can change the way the money is invested in the account, and they can do that up to two times a year. So if you are in maybe something uh, with a higher risk profile and you think, nope, I, I, I'm willing to take a lower return in, in exchange for lower risk, you can, you can move that money around up to twice a year. Um, so uh, people often compare the ABLE accounts to a special needs trust. Those are both different ways that um, uh, that families have used to, to save money for someone with a disability or um, and, and how do they compare? Um, 
one feature is that it's probably going to be cheaper to establish or maintain an ABLE account because you don't have to involve lawyers or trustees um, and it will be a, a process that's much more within uh, the reach and the control of just ordinary people. Another um, key feature is that the, you can use the ABLE account um, much more for, for current expenses and contributions much more easily. Um, you can make frequent contributions and you can make frequent withdrawals. So it's good for short-term need. Um, in fact, some ABLE accounts um, offer the option of a debit card. And so um, if you uh, needed to go uh, buy a pair of crutches or something, you could just use your debit card and, and withdraw that money directly from your ABLE account. The ABLE accounts also, uh, as compared to the special needs trust, probably a good vehicle for, say, young people who might have a summer job or a school or a part-time job, um, and they can say, use that to put their, their job earnings in. It's not a good choice for um, larger gifts or assets. Uh, for one thing, uh, contributions to an ABLE account have to be made in cash. And um, again, there's the $14,000 a year limit. So you couldn't put a car or a house or a condo or something like that into an ABLE account. Um, maybe for, for an asset like that, you would have to use a special needs trust. Um, very important with, as with any investment, um, weigh your own circumstances and financial situation. And um, if you have a financial advisor, absolutely consult them. Um, um, and this is a very busy slide, but it won't be up there for, for reference. Um, and it's just some of the things to think about or to talk about with that financial advisor or think about on your own. Um, what, what are the investment options that are available? Um, and do they meet your particular goals or your risk tolerance? Um, are there uh, special uh, aspects to one program versus another? Uh, very importantly, look at the fees associated with an ABLE account. Um, are they all upfront or, or do you have ongoing fees um, as, as, as long as you hold the account, do the fees, are the fees reduced if you leave your funds in? Fees can really end up diminishing your overall earnings, so you have to look at that carefully. Um, and then does your state offer a state income tax deduction for contributions to an ABLE account? Um, there's a lot of additional information at, um, as we said, this ABLE National Resource Center, um, including webinars on how you go about uh, weighing investments. And uh, so the website for the ABLE Resource Center is there at the bottom of the page. So that was a quick hopscotch through of um, some sort of related topics and sort of disparate topics. And I would like to throw it open to questions if anyone has any. Miriam, we did get a, quite a few questions in. Um, the first one we got in says, what do I do if I get a bill from a hospital and realize that although my HTC is in network, the doctor that I saw that day was not my regular doctor. When I got my bill, this doctor was not in network. Is there anything I can do to fix this issue? Um, this is a big problem. Um, it, it was being called surprise billings because um, uh, obviously that's a very nasty surprise to be faced with. Um, some states are passing laws to to prevent uh, um, the, uh, out of network billing uh, in these sort of circumstances. So that's one thing to look into. Um, uh, 
if you if you've investigated and you're at a hospital that was in network and all of a sudden you have a bill from an um, out of network provider uh, in some states, they are only allowed to bill at the in-network rate. So that is something to, to uh, check into. Um, a hospital ombudsman um, may be of assistance. And, and please contact um, the HFA policy team, and we'll see if there is um, if there is some kind of limit or there's some kind of arrangement that can be worked out. But it is a a problem and it is something that we are engaged in on an advocacy basis at state level and there are some federal level attempts to address that problem also. Thank you. Our next question is how do you identify whether your plan places your drug in like a specialty formulary? Um, so this it, for some drugs, it will be listed on the formulary, and um, uh, you want to look at is a drug preferred or non-preferred. Uh, preferred drugs are much easier to access. With um, clotting factors, because they are so, um, they are not widely used. Sometimes it's hard to find that out, and so um, that is why we advise. People, um, I mean, sometimes they just plain won't appear on the formulary. So, uh, and we say it's a good idea to contact the plan, and you may have to work through a number of representatives before you get someone who is knowledgeable. But um, it, call the plan, keep asking for someone who, until you get someone who's knowledgeable, and then uh, I would really recommend that you document who you talk to and what they said. I don't know. If Thank that you. Is, yeah. Are there some plans that are exempt from any specialty tier laws in certain states? Um, yes, <laughs> there are a lot of, so there are state laws typically do not affect um, plans that are called ERISA plans. Um, those are governed by federal law only and state law is preempted. And basically if you um, get your insurance from a from your employer and it is a large employer, you are probably not protected by state laws um, on specialty tiers um, because you are in one of these so-called ERISA plans and only federal law applies. And it's, it's very hard, this is a, a very hard distinction for, for people to know, um, but Probably, if you get your insurance from an employer and it is a large employer, say GE or something, then you are in what is called a self-funded plan. That means that the, um, while it looks like it, it may come with a name like Blue Cross on the plan, it, Blue Cross is actually the administrator, um, your employer funds it, and the state law protections would not apply. Thank you. Are there any income requirements or eligibility requirements for ABLE accounts? Um, there are not. Um, so the, the eligibility requirements uh, have to do with disability and with age of onset of disability, but um, people of any income level can uh, if they meet the, the disability requirement and the age bonds, people of any income level can open them. Um, Thank you. Another question that we have is, is there a benefit for opening an ABLE account versus just a regular savings account? Um, there's a, a, a somewhat of a tax benefit that um, when the money is um, 
taken out by the beneficiary. So those praise the money came from the family or something. That money and when the money is taken out and used for a qualifying expense, it's not taxable to the beneficiary of the account under federal law. And then there may be state tax um, uh, benefits as well. But the other benef real benefit is that um, there are limits on assets that uh, disabled individuals can own and still be eligible for some uh, federally uh, means-tested programs like Social Security Disability Insurance. And those are quite stringent limits on the assets that those individuals can own. And the ABLE account doesn't count towards that, whereas a regular bank account would. Thank you. Um, how is an ABLE account different than a medical flex spending account? Oof, I'm sorry. I'm not really familiar with the, um, well, it, is a medical flex account like, if a medical flex account is like, say, what I'm familiar with, uh, which is the federal um, FSA, the flexible savings account, but um, money only goes to um, specifically defined health expenses. Um, so, uh, say a dental bill that your insurance doesn't cover or co-pays and so on. Um, the ABLE account, because of the broad definition that it can be used for expenses that promote independence and quality of life as well as um, health, can be used much more broadly for education and housing for transportation. So. Um, it, it's more versatile or more flexible on that in that sense. Thank you. And the last question we have so far is, due to the results of the election, do you expect any changes in the ACA or um, in health care availability? Um, yes, we expect a lot of changes, and we are following that closely and um, you can find on the HFA website um, uh, in the advocacy session we have a transition tracker but right now all the changes to the ACA are completely in flux the new Congress hasn't been sworn in the new president hasn't been sworn in so predicting what will happen to the ACA is very much a matter of reading tea leaves at this point and um, where the, the policy and outreach teams are, are trying to read those leaves and staying on top of things. But for the time being, enrollment is going on in the ACA plans for 2017. So the marketplace is functional, the plans are enrolling, and if you need insurance, and if you are planning to get insurance through the ACA marketplace for 2017, you should do so. Please do not be discouraged by um, news reports or, or speculation as to what might happen. Get insured for the coming year. Those plans will be there. Get insured. Thank you. Um, at this point, it's time to wrap it up. I'd like to thank you all for participating in our webinar this evening. I would also like to thank Miriam for facilitating the webinar. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Have a great night. Thank you.